Evan Parker, welcome again to the University of Huddersfield. Thank you. Uh, you're here to collect your honorary award from us uh, today, but this isn't the first time you've been to Huddersfield, is it? You, you've no, performed over here quite the a bit. years I've been here. Like, I should have done the research and come with precise figures, but I've played in the Lawrence Batley, I've played in the, the Bates Mill, I've played twice in Phipps Hall, I've played out at Wakefield by the Hepworth Museum, mm, I think I've played Lawrence Batley maybe twice, so it adds up, you know. I've, I've been there a lot. You, where did your uh, where did the electroacoustic element start? It began with really primitive what they used to call live electronics, which amounted to not much more than uh, ring modulators, very basic circuitry, and uh, contact microphones. And a lot of the time, something went wrong. It was uh, very primitive stuff compared with what happened later. I suppose the, the state of the art for the first generation of live electronics was, uh, the, or in my experience, was a, a place called the Heinz-Ströbel Stiftung. As it, it's a branch of the Sudwestfunk uh, in Germany, one of the radio stations. And this was a place that Stockhausen used, and uh, they had state-of-the-art analog stuff. But it was all very heavy, very expensive, and unless you were Stockhausen, you, you, you didn't get really much of a look in in places like that. So it was all unaffordable. What, what changed things was the PC revolution, the, the, you know, the laptops and apples are very popular with the, the music people that I work with. They all seem to prefer Apple Macs. And, uh, they became robust enough to do live work. To begin with, there were the kinds of things that you'd only come across in studios. But uh, as the technology became more and more robust, uh, the software would stand up and the, you know, the power was there, the processing speeds were increasing all the time. And, and in those early days, um, you, you obviously, you obviously yeah. started with traditional jazz. It, did, what captured your imagination with that? What, what made you think, I'd like to have a go at this? It's the most peculiar story in a way. Um, I got a request when I was still a, st a student playing with a band where we were really, our dream would be to sound a bit like Coltrane's quartet with McCoy Tyner and so on, the so-called classic quartet. Um, I don't think we did very well at that, but okay. Uh, then, in the middle of things, a request came, C could we do some futuristic music for a, for a science fiction film that was being made by a friend of a friend who was in the film school at the Royal College of Art. And uh, I said, yeah, that sounds, yeah, futuristic music. And the only thing I could think of was uh, Forbidden Planet, the film Forbidden Planet, <laughs> yeah. which everybody cites now <laughs> as uh, the thing that really turned them on. But at the, at the time, I don't know if you know the story of the Forbidden Planet, but they, the West Coast Musicians Union said, that's not music. You can't describe that as music. Right. So the, Lewis and B.B. Barron, they were a, a couple that built their own big synthesizers and made mm -hmm. strange noises. And this was the music of the Krells, a, a, an advanced civilization. And there's a moment where he, the doctor drops a little capsule into a desk <laughs> Fantastic. And th then these w weird bleeps and bloops come, and they are 20,000 years ahead of us, you know. So I thought, okay, well, it must be something like that. So we did some bloops and blobs. And um, now the next thing is real serendipity or the perfect synchronicity because uh, there was Alfreda Bench, she's um, the wife of Robert Wyatt. In those days, she was a fellow student in the film school at the RCA with, with the guy whose film I'd done this music for. But she worked to her money as uh, a behind the bar at Ronnie Scott, so she, she knew all the musicians. And John Stevens, the drummer, was there to uh, support his friend, the painter, Jeffrey Rigdon. And Alfreda said to John, go and check out that film. There's some I think you'd find it interesting. And that was, that was it. John heard the music, and he said, oh, you, interesting stuff. You're up to some, 
And then he invited me to the little theatre club at the, precisely the time when things were just starting. So I met everybody and played with everybody. And that, that in a way, launched me into a, the life, you know. And you launched the electroacoustic uh, ensemble. That came in 1990. That, that came once the computers were cheap enough and robust enough to travel with. Then I started to work with uh, Lawrence Cassily, uh, who's a great uh, professor of uh, computer music, Professor Emeritus, I think, at this point. Uh, all the other guys go and ask him to solve problems when something goes wrong, something crashes, Lawrence will fix it. So I, I've always had the ability to find good people. And and they still perform today, don't they, the ensemble? We are taking bookings right now. If you've got a checkbook <laughs> there, you can. It, it became, uh, actually, the largest version of the group was the 18-piece thing that we did here at Bates Mill. And we're still working on the mix, 47 tracks of digital to, to mix. And uh, we have something like, uh, it's not finished, but it's, it's uh, you know, it, now we've got the shape. Uh, just a few more details too, but it's so hard to to get the studio time where you, where you can um, work on stuff like that. You're regarded as the master of improvisation. Did you know that? I'd, you've been reading my diary. <laughs> <laughs> some people have it, and some people haven't. You've got it as a master of it. How? Is every performance the same? Is it, is it, do, 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 do you wend bits in uh, that you've used before? How of course, you, you, of course. How does it go? How does it go? To, to it's the, one of the to hardest. Those young students who think, right, okay, well, I'm going to have a go at this. Yeah. How do you do it? It's one of the hardest things to actually put into words. What is improvisation? Because the etymology of the word, some people get fixated on that, means unforeseen, I think, is the closest to you, when you break the word down unforeseen, improvisare. So uh, it's, not, it's nonsense for me to say it's unforeseen. I've been doing it all my life. <laughs> what, what do you mean unforeseen? You know, it's like all I want is the freedom to do exactly what I feel like doing and for the limits to be the limits of my imagination at the time in the circumstances with the people that I'm playing with. And for me, Group improvisation, I only bring one element to, to the thing. Of course, as a, one of the senior figures with the with, uh, largest experience, I, I, I bring that, also bring that to the situation. And if that intimidates people, that can also even be a good thing sometimes. People behave themselves with me. They don't mess about. So... Uh, but you are looking for a meeting of minds in a group situation. It's only when I play solo that I really feel, okay, this is what I own. With the electroacoustic ensemble, it, the, the choice of personnel, the physical disposition, and one or two guidelines, that's the composition. And the, when I say one or two guidelines, it, it is literally like three or four instructions every, every 10 minutes or something. And, but it's knowing the, the, the chemistry of individuals, how they'll interact with one another. And that, I am rather immodest about that. I think I do know how that works. So the, the, the success, if, if it is success, comes from asking the right people to play together. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.